the the first week, uh, quite a few weeks ago now, I guess it was about five weeks ago, uh, we, we looked at the beginning of Proverbs and, and uh, really verses 1 through 7 of the first chapter was kind of like, a, a, here are the purposes for this book. And then immediately after that, we looked at the 13 messages um, to youth, and we looked at about two or three every week. And that's from chapter 1, verse 8, all the way through the end of chapter 9. And I know that says 9, 8. It's supposed to say 9, 18. So, because there aren't eight verses in chapter 9. There's 18 verses in chapter 9. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out that I kind of forgot to last week is, remember how we were talking about the woman folly in chapter, I believe it was 9? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that I, I failed to point out last week was, um, it talks about her sitting out, you know, out in the open. You know how she takes a seat on the highest places of the town uh, there in verse 14. And I forgot to mention about the fact that she was glorifying sin. You know, she's out in the middle of the streets. You know, she's not hidden, and she's telling them to, you know, to partake of her sinful habits. And I just thought that was, that was so funny because she's not, she's not even trying to hide it. She's out in the middle of the city saying, "Hey, you guys should do this." You know. But anyways. So the question of the week last week was, what does the world say life is about? You know, you can kind of see it in commercials, movies, music, attitude, politics. What are the different things that you've noticed that our world says life is about? Money. Okay, money. Uh, party. Mm -hmm. Sucks if you're in your 50s, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, it's like fashion. Oh, buddy. Uh -huh. But for real, man. Did you, have you guys seen McDonald's new commercials? It, they actually make McDonald's look really good. I'm yeah. <laughs> like, I want to try it. <laughs> I haven't eaten McDonald's in a while. <laughs> Any other ideas? Fame. Okay. Uh -huh. How high up this the... This is how you can make money. This yeah. is how you become popular. This yeah. is how you do this. Having the uh, biggest and best toys. Yeah. See how I catch my joke to myself? I'm growing, guys. I'm growing. Relations. Uh -huh. What kind? You're talking about sexual <laughs> relations? Sexual. <laughs> Is that what you were talking about? Do what you feel like to do because you want to live once. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure. Okay, anything else? Just keep thinking about that as we go through Proverbs. I don't want to belabor. But anyways, um, in, in chapter 10, he goes, he's, Solomon switches from talking about, you know, these uh, kind of broad things of, hey, listen to wisdom, to more of sayings of wisdom. In fact, that's kind of how chapter 10 starts out, the Proverbs of Solomon. Um, and in this, he starts talking about actual purposes of life. And obviously, he's not going to talk about it in the same way that he does in Ecclesiastes, but still. So the, uh, the first verse, a wise son makes a, glad, makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. So here at the very start out, he, you know, he's already talked about, you know, the different the different appeals to wisdom and whatnot. And uh, his first proverb, and these proverbs, a lot of them do kind of uh, do kind of connect thematically, if not directly. Um, and one thing that you see, you, you you've seen it in bits throughout, but but here you really see it too, is the idea that our life choices are affecting other people. You know, there's a lot of people like Diana was saying, live your own life. You know. YOLO, you only live once. Oh, I saw the funniest thing the other day. Well, I thought it was funny. It, it, it was a sign and it said, YOLO, LOL, JK, BRB, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, you only live once, laugh out loud, just kidding, be right back, Jesus. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. <laughs> Anyways, um, so here at the outset we have how it affects people, and here we have it, it affecting the people who are central in, in, in the society. A wise son makes a glad father. Now remember at this time it's a, uh, pat, if I can say it right, patriarchal society. Basically a, a male-dominated society where the, where the men were the heads of their houses and whatnot. So in, or, in other words, to bring shame to your father would be the greatest insult that you could. And remember this is an honor-shame society. 
where you live and die by honor and shame. The things that you do, you know, honor is always a factor. So for it to bring shame to your father, you know, that's kind of saying the biggest shame that it could bring to. Um, and also, in a sense, it's also bringing shame to yourself because remember, if everyone in your household is under the father figure, then that means to do the father harm would be to do yourself harm because you're under his umbrella of of um, what he's got going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're under him. To if you do something, um, it's not a, it's not a claim for your name; it's a claim for his name. Like I'll give you an example in Genesis. Um, Jacob, Jacob's daughter Dinah is raped, and as a result, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, go and slaughter the whole town. Now, when they did that, who did the town go to? Jacob. The town went to Jacob because he was the head of the house. Does that make sense? And afterwards, in the end of Genesis, he gives it to Joseph, and he says, I've reserved this plaque of land for you. It's yours. See, and he had the ability to do that because he was the head of the house. So I hope you guys kind of get what I'm saying. Yeah. The, the father figures, they were the head of the houses. They were – everything went to, to their name and reputation, so you were actually hurting yourself in this. And he's trying to show the extent of, of foolishness. Um, and a, wi a wise person is also looking out for the other person's best interest more so than themselves. So then it kind of brings up the question, okay, so a wise son makes glad fa a father, so what do I have to do in order to be this wise person who brings gladness to my father? And that brings us to the next, <laughs> to the rest of the book of Proverbs. Um, and that uh, verse 2, treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. So there's a few things that he's saying here. The first thing that he's saying is material wealth is decaying, and when earned improperly, has negative consequences. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit. Right. Okay. But then also, the, there's more. He's not just saying that when it's gained improperly, it has no profit. He's he's more, talking about a bigger principle as well that wealth in itself, material things in themselves, are limited in, the, in their in their usefulness because at death you can't have it anymore. He goes more on this motive in uh, Ecclesiastes, but once again, that's a conversation for the day. Um, and then, uh, but righteousness delivers from death. So there's the idea that righteousness is this far-reaching thing. You know, it's something that righteousness doesn't just impact you now; it impacts you, you much later. And if you look at the contrast here, treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. Well, what does death have anything to do with treasures? See how he's contrasting the two things? Treasures would okay. So his his contrast here, righteousness. Delivers lasting wealth? No, he doesn't say that. He says delivers from death, which is how we know he's talking about more than just money here. Um, he's talking about the short-sightedness and, and its decaying value. Um, so, uh, But then we also see the beginning of the answer of, so what is this wisdom that will bring gladness to my father? And that's, um, that's obviously the opposite of wickedness because wickedness is foolishness. And, and you see this, this, uh, this theme go throughout the rest of the book. He's going to equate things with each other, okay? Uh, righteousness is going to be equated with, we with wealth and wisdom. Not always wealth, but sometimes wealth. Uh, wisdom. Um, there's another word here, love. These things are all going to kind of go together. I'm going to try to highlight that as, as we go. But really, it's these two figures, these two, uh, not straw men, but um, these two archetypes, I guess you could say. Eh. Yeah. These two types of people. We'll just leave it at that. And he's going to contrast them throughout the whole book. Verse 3, uh, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Um, so here we have we have something that the people have kind of jerked out of context. The idea that God is going to... Blessings follow Christians, and they never experience anything bad, and they can just name it and claim it. But that's actually not really what he's talking about here. He's talking about as a principle in life. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, and this goes more than more than food. You know, Christians have starved to death before. He's, he's not saying that. Right. So first, before I say anything, remember that a proverb is not a command. A proverb is generally speaking from experience. Okay, so yes, some sometimes Christians do die of hunger. Okay, um, but that's not even his main point, anyways. His main point is that generally speaking. Uh, that's not how I want to say this. In life, God provides for the needs of his people. 
That doesn't mean that they'll get everything that they want. And it also doesn't mean that they won't face death and decay and, and starvation and those kinds of things. He's just saying in life as a whole, God provides for his people. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. And there's the idea, once again, we looked at this in the first nine chapters, that the wicked have this unfulfilled lust. They're always wanting more and more and more. So naturally, God's going to cut that short. And even if he wasn't going to, they wouldn't receive what they were wanting anyways. So... Um, but with that, he immediately goes to, once again, this is what I said, they're not always connected, but there are different, definitely themes. In the very next two verses, he talks about some reasons that their needs are not being met. Number one, a slack hand causes poverty. <laughs> In other words, you can't say, oh, God's going to provide, I'm just not going to take care of it. Well, yes, but a slack hand causes poverty. But the hand of the diligent makes um, makes rich. And then verse 5, he who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. And the idea here is that um, he gathers in summer is a prudent son. The idea here is that um, not putting off till tomorrow what needs to be done, taking care of stuff when it needs to be taken care of, um, planning ahead, the idea of investments. Um, so in verse, verses 4 and 5, we see some reasons that there are needs that are not met. Um, and then providence, that means providing. Okay, so I, I, I know we don't see that word too much, but basically means God's providing. So God's providence doesn't exempt you from doing what needs to be done. Oh, well, God will provide, yes, but he also told you to be wise with the time. Be wise with what you have. Um, tell me when you guys are done with that, and we can go to the next uh, section. Everybody done? Okay. Um, okay, so it's verses 6 through 7. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, so there's a few things here. I already talked about the name, but in, in, in the ancient cultures, name is oftentimes um, equate synonymous, I guess you could say, with reputation. For someone's name, it would be for someone's reputation, for their uh, well-being, for their honor. Once again, it's, there's kind of this idea of, in an honor-shame society, there isn't just an act of honor and shame. There's kind of like an account you have. See what I mean? And the things you do over the course of your life bring your family, your house, honor. And the things that you do against that bring your house dishonor. And in that vain, you can be ostracized from family, um, which is a way of the family kind of clearing its name and saying, hey, this person has nothing to do with us. <laughs> so, anyways, um, but here we see that the wise are a blessing not just to themselves, but they're also a blessing to other people. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Now, what does that mean? Well, to conceal violence, that means basically that they're talking deceitfully. They make it sound like they don't hate you, but in their heart they really do. And so they're concealing their violence against you. Does that make sense? Um, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is a blessing. See, righteous people, wise people, they leave something something that, that people um, are impacted by positively. But the name of the wicked will rot. So whereas the wicked, I mean the wise person is preserved, the wicked person, uh, their name rots. Are you having difficulties with the chair there? <laughs> uh, you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's the idea here in verses 6 and 7 that the wicked can't be trusted, um, but that the righteous are obviously blessed. See, blessings are on the head of the righteous. It's something like a crown. You can see it. Uh, like everybody can just see that Ben's having very difficult times with that chair. Right. Um, and then uh, right here, uh, where does it say? What's that word that it says there that it, uh, the righteous is lost in your Bible? What does it say in English? What verse? Uh, seven. Can you read it again? The memory of the righteous is a blessing. Oh, okay. But the name of the wicked will rot. Um, and in, uh, oh, that's later. And then verses 8 through 10. The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. And we have here in these three verses, 8, 9, 10, they both end the same way. Look at the end of verse 8. But a babbling fool will come to ruin. Now look at the end of verse 10. And a babbling fool will come to ruin. 
So we have here three obvious proverbs that are that are very much so connected, and they're going to do a lot with. Um, well, I'll get to that in just a second. I don't want to kind of ruin the flow here. Verse nine: Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Whoever winks the eye causes trouble, and a babbling fool will come to ruin. So this idea of what the heck does winking the eye mean? That's basically underhanding, underhanded dealings. When you do stuff, uh, conniving, manipulating stuff, um, uh, making plans behind people's back, when you're making, you know, uh, underhanded dealings. I mean, uh, I can't think of any other way to say it. Because uh, I was going through Proverbs and I was like, winking the eye, what does this even mean? So I went through all kinds of different commentaries, I was looking at different things. Um, I was reading this thing where the guy was explaining the different Hebrew background and stuff, and finally, through a couple hours later, I was able to come to a real basic understanding. Underhanded dealings. Well, that was easy. Why couldn't he just said that? <laughs> um, so, um, if you look here, there's the idea that wise people listen to counsel and walk righteously. Look at this. The wise of heart will receive commandments. A commandment is when somebody tells you to do something, and you receive it. But a babbling fool will come to ruin. Now, this is absolutely essential, and I want you guys to write this down, even if you didn't write anything else down. Wise people do not flaunt their wisdom, but give wisely. Sometimes you see people who think that they're so wise, and they're always shooting off their mouth. Oh, I have words of wisdom for this person's situation. I have words of wisdom for this person's situation. I have all the answers. You know, here's a, here's a, little, a little point here. If somebody's mouth is always open, chances are they aren't wise. Right. Even if they have something knowledgeable in their head and, and something worth worth listening to, if their mouth is always open, that's actually a sign of not having wisdom. Because what did wisdom say? Wisdom, I wisdom dwell with prudence. It's not prudent to shoot your mouth off all the time, is it? And he talks about this throughout the rest of the book. A babbling fool. Who is the person who always has their mouth open? A fool. In fact, he says it like this later on. We'll look at this. I think it's in like the next chapter or two chapters later. He says... Um, if a foolish person closes their mouth, they appear wise. Why is that? Oh, because they're not talking. Yes, yes, that's true. But also because a wise person does more listening than they do talking. Yeah. See what I mean? So that's just a uh, – this, this is a verse that was extremely important to me because all my life I, I heard people who claim such wisdom shooting off their mouth all the time, and I followed in suit with that too. I'm not saying they did it. I'm saying I did it, and they did it too. Yeah. That's not very wise, is it? <laughs> a babbling fool will come to ruin. So that's one of the one of the things we're going to see throughout here. I really I just I really want to say this again. Wise people do not flaunt their wisdom. Listen. If you're one of those people who always has two cents to add to every little conversation, two cents to add to everybody's life decision, keep it to yourself, okay? Wisdom does not just throw itself out like that, okay? Now, wisdom can be found by all. But it's not wise to do that. In fact, Jesus says it a little bit differently. He says, "Don't throw to pro don't don't throw your pearls to swine. Don't throw your your your, your valuable things in front of pigs." Uh -huh. It's the exact same thing of what Proverbs is saying here. Um, so then, obviously, uh, the question always becomes, "Well, so how do you know if someone's a fool or I mean, if someone's a pig or if someone's not a pig?" We'll get to that later. <laughs> Let's focus on the verse at hand. Um, so wise people are listening to counsel, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. So they're always talking. They don't have time to listen to other people. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely. Walks in, in doing the right thing, walks securely. Why? Because because you, nothing, their, their ways aren't going to come crashing down on them. They're walking in a good direction. They're doing the right thing. Now, do bad things happen to good people? Yes. yes. And sometimes it's, it happens so drastically that there's no explanation. Job, for instance. Oh, yeah. See what I mean? And, uh, and we'll probably look at that some other time, but uh, I do want to just point out for the time being that, that bad things do still happen to, to good people. Um, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Obviously, uh, the one person's uh, walking in, in, a, in a good direction, this other person is making their way crooked. Um, so in verse 10, whoever winks the eye causes trouble. Um, so these people who are... Um, just conniving and manipulating, trying to get the upper hand on everybody. Uh, they're causing trouble, and a babbling fool will come to ruin. So obviously we can know not to associate closely with these kinds of people. Don't do business with these kinds of people. But they're prospering. Don't do business with them just because they're prospering. Have integrity. Um, and a babbling fool will come to ruin. 
So then verses 11 through 14, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. So here in verses 11 through 14, we see another theme picked up, and that's the idea of what, what, what you say in your interactions with people, okay? Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. Just a lot of things being said here. Let's try to look at them a little bit by little bit. First off, the wise people say good things and they speak with love. They help others and they learn. That's in essence what he says in these in these verses. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Wise people say good things. They say good things. It's a fountain of life. It, it brings healing to situations. It, it gives people direction in life problems. But the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Once again, we looked at this uh, before in verse like 6, I think it was. Yes, in verse 6. The idea here isn't that, you know what, there's been harm done, so we're going to smooth it over and make sure, you know, we're going to bring healing to the situation. That's not the idea. The idea here is that they, they have vengeance in their heart. They have Ill, Ill will in their heart, and they're pretending like everything's good. Okay, Two completely different things. Covering up an offense is where somebody's done you wrong or you've done somebody else wrong, and you do something or don't do something, either or, to bring healing to the situation. This person isn't doing that thing. This person is pretending like they're best friends, but secretly there's vengeance in their hearts. Um, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Now, anybody who's ever had a family tiff no, doesn't even have to have an example of this. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. What do you see people who are divorced and bitter? Not divorced, divorced and bitter. They oftentimes talk ill about their, their the, who they divorced. You know what I mean? They're always bad-mouthing them about how terrible of a person they were. Um, hatred stirs up strife. Or where um, a parent is, is jealous of the attention with another parent, so they'll say things to the child to get them to turn against the other parent with them. Right? Yeah. Hatred stirs up strife. I mean, I could go on with examples, but I'm pretty sure if you just sit there and think for like five seconds, you're going to have like 50 examples of your own. So I don't really see the need to belabor that point. But love covers all offenses. Well, I just need my spouse to know that what they did hurt my feelings. Okay. But love covers all offenses. See what I mean? Well, I need my sibling to know. I need my child to know. I need my coworker to know. Love covers over offenses. Love covers over offenses. And that's important because he just got talking about the mouth of the wicked concealing violence. And then here he says, but love covers all offenses. So we know that the two things are separate. And I want to say this again. Covering up an offense is not the same as harboring bitterness in your heart and pretending like everything okay is okay. Covering over, uh, covering over offenses is basically where somebody's done you wrong or you've done somebody else wrong. And you do what is necessary to bring healing to the situation. Okay. You let it go. You be the one who was wronged. You do the right thing, no matter what they're doing stupid. You do the right thing. See what I mean? And never once in Proverbs are you going to hear them say, the righteous, righteous and wise people, they do this unless somebody else deserved it, and then it's okay for them to act foolishly. No, he says, wise people do this. Well, what about when it's not fair? Wise people do this. Well, what about if they didn't deserve to be treated like that? Wise people do this. He didn't give except in these situations. These are the ways that wise people act. And one thing that wise people do is they love. Foolish people hate. Remember, he's contrasting the wise person with the foolish person. So he says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. So what's hatred? Foolish. And what's love? Wisdom. See what I mean? Remember, we're still contrasting the two. Is everybody... He, he, Yes. This was illuminating for me. When I when I found this out, I, my, my mind exploded. You guys don't seem very phased at all. Love is wise and hatred is foolish. How, how is that not blowing you guys away? It blew me away. Anyways, um, on the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. Fools are always going to end up in debt. They're always going to end up as somebody else's servant. They're always going to end up as in, in somebody else's good grace. Uh, not good grace. Uh, what's it called? Um, at someone else's uh, beck and call, I guess you could say. Um, they're always going to end up in these bad situations. Was well, it just bad luck? No, there's no such thing as luck. There's no such thing as luck. Um, it's either a curse from God or it's the result of foolishness. See what I mean?
Or sometimes there, there are other things that cause bad things. I'm not saying that. Okay. For instance, sometimes bad things. And Chuck talked about this for like six or seven different Sunday nights about why bad things happen and when God doesn't answer and when God says no. If you're curious about all those things, I'm not saying that's the only time thing. Every time that something bad happens, is because the person was an idiot. I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> if you want more on that, go back and listen to Chuck's messages. I don't feel the need to repeat what he already taught on. I don't think that that's practical. But Raj, for the back of the lack sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. Listen to that. The wise lay up knowledge. They're storing it. They're continually listening. Which brings me to my last point that I said. They learn on that on that thing there. Mm -hmm. The wise say good things. They're a fountain of life. They speak with love. They bring healing to situations. They help others. There in verse 13. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found. They have the right words for your situation. And the last thing there, they learn. The wise lay up knowledge. Well, I'm already wise. Learn more. The wise lay up knowledge. It's an ongoing process. But the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. They're too short-sighted. They can't think things through. Excuse me. Verse 15, a rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. Now, this one took me a while because he's not actually necessarily condoning it, nor is he necessarily condemning it. He's just saying something that is. And a rich man's wealth is his strong city. And, and there's kind of two ideas here. The first is that wealth provides aid for trouble. If you're rich and your um, water, water heater goes out, there, there's a good, a good example. You can buy another one. If you're poor and your water heater goes out, what do you do? You're screwed. You take some cold showers. You take some cold showers. You're screwed. That's kind of the end of that. So there's kind of the first meaning there. It's a strong city. It provides aid for the time of trouble. Oh, well, my car broke down. Not a big deal. I'm going to go take it to the mechanic. But if you don't have money, if you barely kept your car running in the first place, you can't take it to the mechanic. <laughs> um, but it also causes misplaced trust. For a rich man, his wealth is a strong city. It's His wealth is what keeps him That's secure. What it's what he's dependent on. And this is a good way to know if this is you. When calamity comes, are you distraught about it? Or are you trusting in God? Do you do you know? Oh, it's okay. I have well, I have money set aside. Or do you depend on God? Now, I'm not saying having money set aside is a bad thing. I'm not saying that at all. Proverbs has lots of good things to say about being wise with your money. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is our trust should never. And Pastor was just talking about this last Sunday. He said basically, I'm paraphrasing here. It's not wrong to go to a doctor. It's wrong to put your trust in the doctor. <laughs> That's what his point was. And absolutely exact same thing here. The wise man's wealth is a strong city. Now, then he comes to this other thing here. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. The poor are continually troubled by their poverty. They're poor, so then when calamity hits them, they're in even, they're in even a worse situation because they can't resolve the situation. See what I mean? Um, anyways. Righteous, the, the wage of the righteous leads to life, and uh, the gain of the wicked to sin. Now, notice that I contrast these two things. Righteous use wealth to benefit, and fools use it for self-pleasure. A rich man's wealth, I'm sorry, I, I, wrong verse, the wage of the righteous leads to life. He didn't say the wage of the righteous is life. It leads to life. Righteous people use their wealth to benefit. But then, in contrast to this, the gain of the wicked is to sin. Even when they do earn money, even when they do have things, they use it for self-pleasure. It's, it's, it's like sand in the wind. It's, it's for no good. The gain of the wicked to sin. You see this happen a lot with people uh, spending their money buying more cigarettes and alcohol rather than providing for their family. You see them, you know, spending their money on, on video games rather than providing, rather than going out and getting a job. Once again, do not think having video games are a sin. You can see that I have video game consoles right there. But when your whole life is video games, you don't leave the house because of video games. You you ignore everybody and everything for video games. That's a problem. Yeah. That's a problem. <laughs> so, um, and also if you have other things that your money should be going towards and you waste it on video games, that's, that's in essence exactly what we think here. The wage, uh, the gain of the wicked person is sin. It, it, it's just going straight there. Um, so very important that, to note that he says he does not say the wage of righteousness 
Okay, the wage of the righteous leads to life. The wage of the righteous leads to life. Because when righteous people get profit, they use it wisely. So it leads to life. They use their money to benefit others, to set out for the future, to plan for things. But foolish people, they burn right through it before it even hits their pocket. My dad used to say, is there a hole in your pocket? <laughs> don't let money... No, 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 no. You used to say, don't let money burn a hole in your pocket. That's what he used to say. Um, 17 through 21, another kind of section here. We'll read through it. And we'll, this is just a brief thing here. Con conflict and interaction with others. We'll look at them more in depth here in just a second. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, the heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. So now let's look at these more in depth. Everybody okay with me skipping ahead? Okay, cool. Um, so first let's look at verse 17. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life. But he who rejects reproof leads others astray. I mean, this one's pretty simple. You can't teach others what you don't know. People, these are two different points, by the way. The comment means that it's a different point. So let's look at the first point first. Whoever heeds instructions on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. Pastor just talked about this. I think it was two weeks ago. He said, have you ever talked to somebody who has never dealt with their with their bitterness towards their parents, and then they try to counsel somebody else about their relationship with their parents? Yeah. Right here, verse 17, he who rejects reproof leads others astray. It's like pastor has read Proverbs before. Right. It's just like that, huh? Uh, I don't think that's right. <laughs> so now we see the first message here. You can't teach what you don't know. Uh -huh. The uh, uh, He who rejects reproof leads others astray. So... Uh, people, these fools, they're not just hurting themselves, they're hurting other people too. But the wise, they're heeding instruction, they're on the path to life, <coughs> they're a great example, which leads us to the second point. They are example, you are an example of either hard-heartedness or righteousness. So I mean? You're always an example to people whether you want to be or whether you don't want to be. That's not something you can choose or choose not to be. That's something that you are regardless. If you are living, you are an example to somebody. Um, so your life definitely does affect other people. Uh, verse 18. Uh, the, the one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slanders is a fool. So here we have a little bit of a dilemma, don't we? If you keep hate in, it's, it's going to cause you to lie. And if you let it out, it's foolish. It's, the one who conceals hatred has lying lips. Okay, so I'll let it out. I'll just let people know what I say. Whoever utters slanders is a fool. So if I, I, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. Isn't that the, isn't that the saying? Yeah. If, I, if I let it out, it's going to end up bad, and if I keep it, it's going to end up bad. Yeah. Well, it kind of seems like that, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Except for one little thing. Hate is itself foolish. He just showed us that in verse uh, 12. Yeah. Hatred stirs up strife. It's, an act, it's something that foolish people do. Okay? So uh, uh, as, as you grow in wisdom, eventually you have to find a place of, of letting... Hatred go. And you know, the thing is, it, as I overcame things in my life, I thought there'd be a day when this was the day of my victory, right? I would write it down. This is the day that I stopped doing that stupid thing. It's a gradual process. And it goes on sometimes for years of fighting before you get the upper hand in the situation. Doesn't matter what you're talking about. Um, cheating. Lying. Uh, adultery, all these different things. It doesn't matter what. It's oftentimes a slow, steady fight. But you have to keep fighting because if you let it for even one day, you go start going back awful fast. Um, and once again, he's not talking about trying to smooth it over. I already mentioned that, so there's no reason in, in, in telling that again. So then the only real answer we have <coughs> is to genuinely forgive people. If we can't keep it in and we can't let it out, thereby equating both things as foolish, we can say that the only thing we have to, we have left to do is get rid of the hate. Don't let it be there on the inside or it come out. Well, that's a lot easier said than done, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That leads us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. As you have been forgiven, so forgive others. Seventy times, heaven. Oh, man. <laughs> <All right. laughs> 
<laughs> so, the one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slanders is a fool. We want to see hatred be washed away. We don't want to be fools. Verse 19, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Here we go. What did we just say? What did we say about wise people not always talking about everything, not always giving their two cents, not always shooting off their mouth? When words are many, transgression is not lacking. In other words, if you keep talking for long enough, eventually you're going to say something stupid. Uh -huh. And I'll give you another example. When somebody comes to you for help, do you listen to them or do you try and give them all the answers and fix all their problems? It happened to me, I, um, I'm not going to say the names, but some, I was talking to somebody, and I literally had nothing to say, and I told that person, I said, I really got nothing to tell you, to, but I'll listen as much as you want me to listen, <laughs> but there's like literally nothing, I, not, I don't know what to say. <laughs> right? <laughs> Buddy. That's like every day of my life. Pastor will ask me something, and I'll be like, man, I don't know. <laughs> But you know they're just happy to some just somebody, somebody to live. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they already feel better just by that. Yeah. Somebody cares just to listen. You know? Even though we didn't have all the right words, Diana. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's not necessary. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just feel that like God tells you just listen. Just yeah. Don't a lot of times people anything, don't really you know? want. Yeah. You to say something. They just want a sounding board. No, yeah. but yeah. seriously, like that is something that I learned this year. Gracie and I were talking with somebody, and they, and they asked me a question that they would already decided the answer on. Um, but, you know, I was going to give the, the, the correct theological answer, and I just felt like God was telling me, nope, that's not the right answer. I was like, okay, so what do I say? And the answer, I mean, the question was, why, why, do bad, you know, why do people suffer? Why do bad things happen to people? And they were asking what to do in that kind of situation, and... and I know that my answer is from God because he stopped me from saying what I was going to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the answer was this. I said, a lot of times when people ask you why bad things are happening, why God is letting these bad they don't actually want an answer. They more want compassion. They want you to listen to them. They, 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 want, they want comfort for the pain that they're feeling. Yeah. I said it less elegantly. I said it in about one short sentence, but... Basically, that's what I said. I'm I'm elaborating so that you guys kind of know where I'm coming right. from. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and after I said it, I was like, "Huh, that's right." In fact, I've taught that very thing in yams, and it just clicked in my head. I was like, "Oh, I get the thing that I was teaching now. I get it now." <laughs> and and it's true. Oftentimes, people are are are, are going to ask you things that they don't want an answer to. So great, great, actually great points, guys. Um, so uh, in verse 19. We see that there is no filter for fools. Oh, you can leave it, buddy. I'll get it with the with the broom. Okay. Um, we see that there really is no filter for fools. They have no no thing to to <laughs> to weigh what they're saying. It just kind of instantly when it hits their heads, it comes out their mouth. Yeah. <laughs> There's no filter, and they're always talking, so there's even less chance for a filter. <laughs> right. Um. And then also it's easier to fall to sin if your mouth is open. That's just an obvious thing. But when words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. And this is kind of the idea of gossiping and complaining. Oftentimes gossiping and complaining doesn't start out as that. It kind of gets sidetracked, right? It starts out as just a general conversation. Maybe somebody's just tired or whatever. And it just kind of streams over into gossip or complaining. And then... Once it's there, it starts feeling good, so then they kind of egg each other on, and then, right. then there are genuinely some people who are just gossip mongers. I'm not denying that, but not everybody who gossips is a gossip. Like What I'm saying is not everybody who's in a gossip conversation is someone who habitually – gossips right. it's someone sometimes you just get caught and you're like oh man how did that even happen yeah. <laughs> i didn't mean to and so then when you realize it's like oh i feel like an idiot but anyways and sometimes you get sucked into those situations and yeah. you don't know how to how escape to get, it. <laughs> it just, you don't know how to get out of it like this morning, Chuck and I were talking about pastor and I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, anyways, um, when words are many, that's just a good proverb to remember. Memorize that one. Write it down somewhere. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. Whoever restrains his lips is prudent, and wisdom dwells with prudence. Keep that one in mind, guys. That that one's just good. 
Um, and then, uh, excuse me, verse 20, wicked, wicked people are corrupted, but righteous bring forth from their heart. What did Jesus say? From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Didn't, isn't that what Jesus said? Well, that's basically what Proverbs says here. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. Their, their tongue is choice silver. But the heart of the wicked is of little worth. The core of their being is of little worth. They're a corrupted person. But a wise person from their good heart brings forth wise words from their tongue. So from, their tongue is like choice silver. So you see the contrast there? The heart, the foolish person is corrupted to their innermost being. The wise person from their good innermost being comes forth. So how do you get that uncorrupted heart? By the grace of God working in you. Yeah. That's it. And don't worry, there will never be a moment in time where you have a perfectly perfect heart. That's not going to happen. But God will continue to work in you, and you will continue to grow. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of, lack of uh, sense. So here we see the idea once again that the wise are helping others. The lips of the righteous feed many. The, the righteous are feeding many. There's a, the idea that wise people are helping others. But fools can't even help themselves. Fools die for lack of sense. They don't listen to other people, so they can't get instruction on what the heck to do. They don't see what they're doing wrong because they're too stupid to see their own, their own path in front of them. Why? Because it says that God's words are a lamp to our feet. It talks about this in Psalms and Proverbs and elsewhere in the Bible, but I think that's sufficient. Uh, so there's the idea here that well, they're not listening to God. They're foolish in all their ways. So they're blinded to their own ways. And then they die for lack of sense because they don't get any instruction. They don't get any guidance. They don't. They just live their own way. They live according to the lust of their flesh, which is very foolish. Anybody still writing notes? No? Okay. We're almost at the end of Proverbs 10, guys. So just a, 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 a few notes I wanted to say. The first thing, the world says wise people don't need the input of others because they're smart enough, right? We see the wise sages, these monks that are on hilltops that people go to visit, right? But God says wise people are wise because they accept the input of others. Do you see the difference between the world? Whoa. Between the world and God. It's like the question of the week. What does the world say life is all about? But what did we see that Proverbs said that life was all about? Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit. It's not about fame. It's not about the clothes. It's not about fashion. But righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs says that life is about righteousness. Proverbs says that life is about wisdom, and wisdom is about God. So in other words, Proverbs is talking about life is all about God. Charlie Hall said it like this, you're the center of the universe. Everything is found in you. So, that brings us to verse 22. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. So we, we've talked about riches gained by ill gain. Now we find a whole different kind of riches. And that's God's riches. The blessings of the Lord make rich. And once again, he's not necessarily talking about earthly wealth. God's blessings don't make you feel bad after it's done. Now, he's talking about two different things, though. The blessings of the Lord are found in... Concrete things as well as more... Fluid things. For instance, uh, a job would be considered a blessing of the Lord. Having the wisdom to know how to handle the money that you get from work would be called a blessing from the Lord, right? So with that being said, there is a practical sense to this. Honest labor, there is no bad feeling after you've worked hard and done a good job's work. It, you, you get your paycheck, you earned it, it comes with, with great relief. Mm -hmm. But when you don't deserve the money that you get, that's there is no – not only that, but there, there's a sense of entitlement that comes too, which is why I, I highly encourage people – who are able to work to work. I know that some people are not able to work. I get that. But then there are some people who are able to work that just simply do not. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm not talking about traumatized people, people who, who you know, even like we were talking over the past couple weeks, some people who, like, their, their psychologist or their psychiatrist says, don't get a job. Well, that's different. But I'm talking about people who can get a job, but instead they sit home all day, they're in their 40s and 50s, and they still haven't done anything. They get up whenever they want. They have no set patterns in their life. There's no discipline. That's what I'm talking about. Once again, I know that there's some people who genuinely cannot work. Not talking about them. Um, 
But God's blessings also don't make you feel bad in the sense that when you strive after the things of the world, you get those earthly things, but it doesn't satisfy you. But when you seek after the Lord and you make him your prize, God's blessings, right here in verse 22, God's blessings will make you rich in a whole different sense. Because you realize that you don't actually need the wealth of the world, do you? And she'll be rich in a whole other sense, and it will come, what does it say, with no sorrow added to it. In fact, even more so, because not only does God give you blessings that you don't feel bad about how you got them, because God gave them to you because he's good. Mm -hmm. But then also, you don't feel bad about it because it removes the world's way of thinking that life is all about the material blessings. But it's not all about those things. So with that, with the understanding that it's about God and not about things, sorrow is lifted from us. that make sense? So it has kind of a dual meaning there. God's blessings don't make you feel bad. And you're, you're going to see that one repeated a lot. We probably won't spend as much time on the other chapters in Proverbs, but this one uh, is kind of setting the tone for the rest of the chapters that fall. Um, so work is a blessing. I already mentioned that. You can also kind of just see the, the thankfulness in Solomon's heart when he's, when he's writing this. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. It's true riches. Have you ever heard Sandy say, I'm blessed? Mm -hmm. Think of it kind of like that. It adds just these, these blessings to it. And he adds no sorrow with it. What, what goodness God has bestowed on us. And then verse 23, doing wrong is like a joke to a fool, but wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. Now, whose Bible says is like a joke? Does anybody say something different than that? Pleasure and evil Finds pleasure. What translation do you have? Uh, NIV. N NIV? Yeah. Now that's weird. Write this moment down in your life. That is more accurate than the ESV right now. Hmm. Write this down in your life in, in your in your calendar, okay? Let this always be the night that NIV was more accurate than ESV. <laughs> because ESV translates translate doing wrong is like a joke to a fool. But wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. And the idea here isn't so much isn't so much it's like a joke, like haha, it's like it comes easy. It's a pleasure to do it. It's it's fun to do it. It's something that, that he doesn't have to think about it. It just happens. It's natural to him. You know what I mean? Have you ever have you ever heard somebody who who always lies about everything and it just comes so naturally? And you ask them something before you you even finish asking the question, they have an answer that's a lie right off the mouth. Uh -huh. It just came so naturally. That's what he's saying here. That's the idea behind it. Not that it's a joke. Like, haha, that was funny. Completely different idea there. And and I don't know why ESV sided with that because usually ESV every time other time that I've found out is a lot more accurate than than sometimes even the NASB. So that's that's something to, worth considering. Uh, but anyways, evil is easy and fun for the wicked. But wise people enjoy righteousness. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, those goody two-shoes, how boring is it to go to church all the time and to do good things? How boring would life be if I didn't go to the parties? Have you ever ta heard ta people oh, talk, yeah. about, talk about stuff like that? Well, here, he said, he's exactly talking about that. Wisdom is pleasure to man of understanding. It seems like, I'm just saying, I see you're about ready to say something. It seems like life is boring if you live righteously. But then when you actually do it, you understand that it's a life of true pleasure. You wake up the next morning and you're not, you don't have a hangover, you feel good, you have a bearing for your life, you have purpose, you know why you exist. It's just a good feeling. But when you're out there partying every night, you don't have good feelings. You get drunk, you don't remember half your life. You wake up all the time with, with, with a sore head, and your relationships get shot because you do something or say something stupid while you're drunk. <laughs> but with right, but with righteousness, you realize that, that, that there's just so much more. Go ahead and say what you're going to say. Um, in the NASB... It says, doing, wicked, doing wickedness is like sport to a fool, and so is wisdom to a man of, of understanding. That's even that's even better than, yeah. than what the ESP says. But I will say this, the Amplified Bible, you guys, watch out for that Bible. Okay? Uh, that Bible is cray-cray. Okay? <laughs> like, it's cray-cray. First off, if you don't even understand the ancient languages, it's not even worth reading anyways. Oh. And most people read the Amplified Bible, read it because they don't understand the, uh, the, the ancient... So it literally has no audience. The second thing is they will add things in there by implication. Like on some places in here, there will be added verses. 
if it's in no other translation, it will be added parts to the verses because it, it was an implied meaning. Well, I I guess I see what they were going for, but sometimes what they think that's implying isn't what it was actually implying. <laughs> it's like if you read the message. Have you ever read that yeah. that translation? Yeah. How he just says things, it's like, I'm pretty sure that's not actually what they meant when he wrote that. Like, I see that you're trying to make it more understandable for people, but I think you missed the meaning. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Word of warning: Stay away from the amplified. <laughs> Anyways, I'm getting off topic. But the, um, that takes us to verse uh, 24. Unless there are questions, no questions. Okay. Um, what the wicked dreads will come upon him, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. There's so much here, guys. So much here, and and I wish that I could point out every little thing that it's saying. But honestly, some of these things you can only get by just studying for yourself. Honestly, and remember, I am not saying everything that Proverbs is saying. I am giving a very basic walkthrough of Proverbs. You should be saying this for yourself, and hopefully you will find more than I have than the simple things that I have revealed to you. Because I am not the wisest person in the man in the world. That was Solomon. So surely there are more wise things for you to learn. Who brings a baby to young adults? <laughs> oh wait, that was me. <laughs> um. Okay. Wickedness gets curses and fear. Look at this. What the wicked dreads will come upon him. So first off, there's a natural result because they're living foolishly, and then the things come upon them. But then there's also another thing. You know, wicked people have panic attacks just like righteous people do. Did you know that? They have depression just like righteous people do. You okay there, Ben? There are other chairs that don't have <laughs> such troublesome cogs on them. <laughs> Anyways, um... But the difference is that wicked people go to sleep with dread and they wake up with fear. Proverbs talks about this later on. Their whole life is unpleasurable. They worry about death all the time because they have no hope of tomorrow. When I see a smug atheist, I, 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 I get a little bit scared. Because that means that they have been so hurt in the past that they have become so bitter towards Christians that's actually caused them to become bitter towards God to the point of blinding themselves to their fear. That's that's a scary place to be at, guys. Uh, but anyways, but then there's also the idea that God God brings curses by. Okay? But the desire of the righteous will be granted. I'm waiting for her comeback. Oh. No? Sometimes what she does is she... Ah! And she takes so long to draw in her breath that you think she's done, and then she'll go for a round two. So I was waiting for it, but okay. All right, <laughs> But the desire of the righteous will be granted. Um, righteous people gain God's blessings. They gain his, his protection. With fear... Um, hold on. Wickedness gets curses and fear, and with fear, imagined or real fulfillment. See, with the fear of the wicked, sometimes there is fulfillment to what they're saying, but sometimes they'll... Th it's like this. If you've ever had a panic attack, sometimes the things that you fear come on you. In other words, you think that you're having a heart attack, so you feel the symptoms of a heart attack. You think that you're having this, so you feel the symptoms of that. It's not actually happening to you, but you believe it to be happening to you. See what I mean? In the same way, wickedness gets curses and fear, and with that fear, imagined and sometimes real fulfillment come with it. But, once again, righteous people go through these things too. So just because you have depression, anxiety, uh, panic attacks, these kinds of things, doesn't mean you're, you're a wicked person. Okay? But the difference being that wicked people, their hopes are shattered. That's the difference. Whereas righteous people face opposition just like everybody else, but their hopes are not shattered. Okay, What the wicked dreads will come upon him. It, it's just an imminent doom for them. But the desire of the righteous will be granted. What and here's another th thought that 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 um, came to me while I was while I was studying this that I felt like God was speaking to me personally was when you are a righteous person God changes God changes your desires to His desires and as your desires are His desires you will see them fulfilled. Whereas before you desired the best car on the block, now you desire the salvation of your long lost one, and you'll see it. See what I mean? Those desires will be fulfilled. But the wicked person, they're always desiring more and more because they're so greedy, they're never going to see it, and even the hopes that they do get will be dashed. So, 
Um, and also, this has not just immediate implications because sometimes wicked people live a heck of a lot longer than righteous people sometimes. And they live healthier. And they live healthier sometimes. So, but when all is said and done in the final judgment, there is no reward for that lifestyle. Their wealth died with them. See what I mean? Their wealth died with them. And instead, they're faced with an eternity apart from God. See the, the contrast there. So anyways, takes us to verse 25. Um, uh, here, when the, wicked, when the tempest passes, the wicked is no more, or when the storm, it's kind of like, let's just, for the sake of ease, let's just say tempest is shippy talk or sailor talk for storm. Yeah, that's good enough. Uh, the wicked is no more, but the righteous is established forever. So the idea here is that sudden problems destroy the wicked, their things, their emotions, and their lives. But righteous persevere because calamity can't remove God's blessings. Righteous people persevere because calamity cannot destroy God's blessings. When the tempest passes, the wicked is no more. Their hopes are gone. Their money is gone. Their, their things are gone. Their emotions are shattered. Their lives are destroyed. Right, but the riches, um, but the righteous, not riches, the righteous is established forever. See, when the tempest comes, it doesn't destroy them because their hope is set on something else. There's an old hymn that, that goes something like this: um, "My hope is built on nothing less than, than Jesus' blood and righteousness." Because, see, the the idea is that, that the storms will come, the tempest will come, but it's not going to destroy the righteous person. Righteous persevere because calamity can't remove God's blessings. How can the troubles of life remove our salvation? As Paul so eloquently put, they can't. Neither height nor depth nor nor death nor nor anything in between. It, it can't separate us from God's love. Nothing's going to remove that. So the tempest doesn't destroy the righteous person because they're 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 and they have blessings from above. They have something from above. Now here is something that I kind of misunderstood when when for the, until actually just the other day when I was studying for this. Like vinegar to the teeth, I thought what he was saying. Was the vinegar makes your teeth sensitive? <laughs> I, oh, forgive me. And smoke to the eyes. And, uh, which brings me to the thing that I was like, I've never had itchy teeth from this vinegar. <laughs> but okay, let's get to that. Hold on. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the slugger to those who send him. The idea is that vinegar is sour. The teeth is not the literal teeth, it's the mouth. Okay? Like vinegar is sour and smoke burns the eyes. When a boss sends a slugger to someone who doesn't do a good job, it bites them in the butt. Not in the bud. It's not biting something off of the bud. It bites them in the butt like a dog attacking your butt. Okay? <laughs> um, what was I saying? Um, in fact, I'll give you an example of this. When you put a sluggard in charge of something, you tell them to take care of it, you expect it to get done, right? Yeah. And you come back later, and it's not done. Or they hound you all the time. What should I do with this? What should I do with this? Are you an idiot? I put you in charge of it. Go do it. <laughs> If you've ever, if you ever, um, well, I'm not gonna say that, but <laughs> anyways, um, it's it's someone who you can't put in charge of stuff. You, you can't you can't tell them to go do something because they don't do a good job. They don't do it right when they when you told them to. They put it off till later. It, it's like vinegar in your mouth. It's sour. It, it's like smoke in your eyes. It's burning you. The very thing that you sent them to do comes back and bites you. So. Obviously, don't be that person. <laughs> Verse 27, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. And I do want to say this again. I mentioned this a hundred times. When we read Proverbs, oftentimes we like to see how it applies to everybody else. Right. See how it applies to you. Just let me save you a lot of time, a lot of time and effort and being stupid. See how it applies to you. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. But the years – and that, let me just back up. That's another way that, that, that the babbling of fools – because they've always got an answer for everybody else, but they can't see how God's word applies to them. Okay, now back to verse 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be sh will be uh, short. Yeah. So there's the idea here. What? Are cut short. Yeah. Uh, there's the idea here um, of general well-being. No, once again, not necessarily that, that Christians live longer than anybody else. We already talked about that. Um, but there's the idea that the quality of life is different. And generally speaking, righteous people can live longer, generally speaking, because they're living righteously, right? They're not starving to death, hopefully, because they're managing their money right wisely in, in a hypothetical situation. 
obviously there are sometimes when, when bad things happen to good people, once again. So generally speaking, there's well-being, there's blessings, there's eternal life beyond those things, right? Because sometimes the well-being in our life just doesn't really go well. Sometimes our kidneys shut down for no apparent reason. Uh, it does, Chuck. <laughs> it does. I've never heard of that. But beyond those things that come and go, there's the idea of God's blessings. And there's beyond that the idea of eternal life. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. You can't get much more prolonged than eternal life, can you? It doesn't get much farther than that. But the years of the wicked will be short. Jacob put it like this, the years of my life have been short and miserable. Verse 28. Uh, the hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. I don't really want to spend too much time on this one. It's kind of, I thought it was kind of, Kind of self-explanatory, yeah. but basically the righteous have lasting hope and fulfillment and joy. It's something that, that doesn't depart from them, uh, but the way, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. It's real similar to that verse up by uh, 24. What, what the wicked dreads will come upon him, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. It's, it's similar to that one. Um, verse 29. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless. Now this one is another one of those good ones. It actually seems like it belongs in Psalms. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. This idea is that righteousness keeps feet straight and brings protection from God. If you're living righteously, you're not going to co-sign on a loan, because that's stupid. If you're living righteously, you're not going to get yourself into debt, hopefully. Hopefully, because it's a stupid way of living. See what I mean? And that's the idea of Proverbs. Is, hey, these things are stupid. Oops, I do that one and that one and that one. All right, let's work on, on stopping doing those things. See you know what I mean? And that's what Proverbs is about. It's not about beat yourself up for the stupid things you've done in the past. It's about, okay, here you are now. Either choose righteousness or choose foolishness. So, um, the way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless. When we, you walk in God's ways, he has a way of protecting you. And there's a divine element of this. We're divine intercession. As you do things for God's kingdom, he has a way of just guiding your feet. Looking back on my 25 years of life, I'm young. 25 years of life, I can see how God is guided and directed. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. How God is protected for all the different things. Um, for instance, when I got sick that time in 2012 or 13, I don't go to doctors. I went to an urgent care because that was meeting halfway. And they and the guy said to me this. I, I'll never forget this. I, every, I, pretty much everything that was like three months is a blur. But there are some things that really stick out. And he said to me, he said, I know you're not going to go to the doctor tonight. But to encourage you to go to the doctor tonight, I'm not going to charge you for this at all. And I'm going to personally ask you, please go to the ER tonight. I am personally asking you to please go to the doctor tonight. I went to the ER that night. When I don't go to the ER, Michael doesn't go to the doctor. <laughs> no. I went to the doctor, and it was a good thing because I might have not made it to the next day. And now this is something that really bothers me. None of my organs had lasting effects. I complete bill of health. Chuck, on the other hand, just out of nowhere, his kidneys fell. Do you know how, how many nights of sleep I lost from that? God, why would you spare my kidneys when I didn't take care of my body and – why? He's already got, got. He's already in a wheelchair. What are you gonna do now? Take his arms? You know, I lost a lot of sleep from this because I felt like God was being really good to me, and He was picking on other people. I was like, what? And it's hard. It is hard to to learn to live with those kinds of things. But realizing that it's not God, it's not you who does it. It's God who's making the choices. That that makes it slightly easier, I guess. But anyways, the Lord is a stronghold. Okay. God guided me and protected me those times. And even Chuck, with, with he could have died in that, but God still protected him and guided him through the process. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And God is always there for us through those things. It might seem, oh, but this bad thing happened. Yeah, because bad things happen in life. That's what life is all about. Yeah. That's life's middle name. Life, really bad life. That's its name. Mm -hmm. but, but God is with us through it. And even the things that the world, that others, that yourself, that Satan meant for evil, God turns for good. That's the theme of Genesis. That the things that were meant for evil, God turned for good to good. That's the theme of Genesis. And right here we see it again. Um, the hope of the, uh, verse 9, the way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless. 
once again, blameless not being people who never mess up, blameless being people who put their faith in God. Um, okay, that brings us to the last bit here. Verse 30, the righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not dwell in the land. This is something that actually relates more with the with the covenant of Moses. Um, they they had this part of the and, and Deuteronomy says this a lot, you know, hey, if you do these things, I'm going to keep you in the land. If you don't, I'm going to remove you from the land. So Proverbs here is pretty much just validating what Deuteronomy already taught. How does this apply to us today? More about eternal salvation. The righteous will never be removed from salvation is more of how it applies to us. Um, but the wicked will will not, uh, will not dwell in the land. Um, um, also, there's the idea that Peter kind of talked about. Generally speaking, if you don't do sinful things, you won't be arrested. Generally speaking, there are exceptions to this rule, as Peter and Paul were both later arrested and killed by Rome for nothing. They literally did nothing, so obviously there are exceptions to the rule. But they both, Peter and Paul, said how generally speaking, you don't have to fear the government if you don't do anything wrong. Um, and also, there's the idea of being blessed by God and protected by God. There's also the idea that success, um, that, that, that righteous people have success as they follow God's ways because you're not picking your own way. You're going the Lord's way. That makes sense? People try to do this. I'm going to go my way, and God's going to bless me. No, no, no. Proverbs says this. In all your ways, acknowledge the Lord, and he'll make your path straight. He doesn't say, in all your, in all your ways, go your own way. He says, in all the ways that you are choosing to go, see the difference? The difference is one is I am choosing my own path. The other one is I am making decisions with my life, and, and, and in the process of that, I'm making God the center, and I'm doing it to seek after God, and God is guiding that process. You understand the difference? So yes, I am, I am not a Calvinist. I do not believe that every step we take is ordained. I believe that I have chosen to be here as an associate pastor, and I believe that at any moment... I could choose to go somewhere else, but I believe that I have made the choice to stay here. I don't believe I was preordained to be here. I believe that Chuck was not preordained to be here. I believe that God wanted us to be here, okay? But I do not believe that every moment is, is preordained. However, with that being said, I do believe, the Bible makes this clear, that there are some times when God specifically sets a task for someone specifically. John the Baptist is a perfect example of this. God chose that specific task for John the Baptist for him to do. And I do believe that's a thing. Uh, Chuck tells a story of when he was at that uh, Seventh-day Slumber concert. And then at our church, there was a Seventh-day Slumber sticker on, on our drum set. You know, the validation of God's direction. Absolutely. See what I mean? Did you kind of, kind of see what I'm yeah. saying here? So, awesome. As you follow God's ways... Um, uh, God causes the success that you that you experience. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not dwell on the land. There's the idea of righteousness uh, brings success, and, and unrighteousness brings unsuccess, failure. Uh, verse 31, the mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. Uh, brings forth, now this is very interesting. The idea here, the mouth of the righteous brings forth, the idea is to bear, like to bear fruit. Um, so in other words, the fruit of the righteous is wisdom. The mouth bears wisdom. It's the fruit of the of their of their of their of their righteousness. Um, but as a as a contrast here, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. What do you do with an unfruitful branch on a tree? You cut it off. So a lot of people kind of get a little bit confused. Are you saying that their tongue will be cut out of their mouth? No, no. He's talking about the bearing fruit of the righteous. And the cutting off of the tree of the wicked. In other words, there's the idea of righteous people are being blessed and are blessing others. Wicked people are not a blessing to anyone, so God removes them from the tree. <laughs> Paul talked about this with uh, the uh, Gentiles being grafted into the branch. Anyways, uh, and uh, Buzzle in, uh, uh, I believe his commentary was just called Proverbs. Uh, it was in, it was a uh, part of, mm, I forget which commentary set, but anyways, um, and he, he said, wise words are a result of righteousness. That's just, yes, yes, that, wise words are a result of righteousness. And so I want to draw a slight uh, contrast here. A lot of times there will be some people who are wise in the ways of the world. You see a lot of CEOs of major corporations. They're wise in the ways of business, right? 
However, they're not wise in the ways of the Lord, and in their wisdom of business, they oftentimes do unrighteous things, which is ultimately unwise. Even though it seems to profit the business, it neglects God as the overseer of everything. So, uh, okay. And then the last verse of the chapter, the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked, what is perverse? Have you ever talked to somebody that they just didn't know what to say, and so they said something stupid? <laughs> and it seemed like they always said these random things that were off the wall that were just real stupid. Uh -huh. Think of that. Wise know what to say and what is appropriate, and it is a good thing when they speak, because the righteous are well acquainted with what is good. Okay? The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the, of the wicked, what is perverse. That's all they ever think about. That's all they ever talk about. Right. Have you ever talked talk to someone who, who, who looks at pornography and sleeps down with a lot of women? Have you ever talked to those kinds of people? What are they always talking about? Well, having sex. Yeah. Because the mouth of the wicked, what is perverse? They, they know what is perverse. So anyways, um, and with that, the wise choose words well and use few of them. Wise people choose their words well, and they use very few words. That's something you're going to want to remember. Uh, because oftentimes we get real popped up in our wisdom, and we just think that we need to tell everybody how they need to fix their lives. And uh, we want to tell everybody how well, how we see things, and, and sometimes how we see things isn't exactly right. So the wise choose words well, and they use few of them. Remember that, guys. Next time you're shooting off your mouth to somebody, remember this. Wise people speak rarely, and they speak well. So anyways, the question of the week. What do you have the hardest time receiving instruction on? What do you have the hardest time when somebody tells you about when somebody instructs you on, when somebody uh, corrects you on? What is the hardest thing for you? Okay, And we'll look at that next week. Any questions? Zach, you look like you had something on your mind, no? No. All righty, guys. That's that's it. If there are no questions or comments, yeah, I go ahead. I just wanted to add something. Go ahead. Uh, from what you said earlier, actions can also speak louder than words sometimes. Yeah. Just A lot of even times. how you approach somebody can change their day. Yeah, absolutely. And not just sometimes, Nicole. A lot of times. Yeah. Tell you what, man. You are on something. You are on fire. <laughs> they were stuck together. I mean, I'm not going to sit there prying it off and <laughs> touch that one. Okay, no other questions or comments?